Okay. Um, I think we are running. Jenny, can you hear this correctly? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Theo. I'm from Concord. Um, we'll be introducing Jenny today um, to do the presentation. Uh, we've got 45 minutes ahead of us. Um, what we will do is I'll be monitoring questions if there are any, and we will go over them at the end um, so that we can let Jenny walk through her presentation and then we'll get on to the point. Um, the session is recorded as well, so if you do want the recording, just um, send me an email afterwards or just get in touch with me and we can also send it in case you um, happen to miss a bit. Um, Jenny is the presenter now, so I'm just going to be quiet and um, let her go. There you go, thanks. Jenny. Thank you, Theo. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm sorry if I feel a bit nervous as I get started. It's very weird doing a, a presentation without having anyone to look at, but um, I'm imagining all your friendly faces smiling back at me. Um, so I'm very uh, thankful for this opportunity to be able just to spend some time thinking about um, some ideas about the future of what I think might be happening in school libraries. I'm the um, head of library at St Andrews Cathedral School in Sydney and um, I thought it might be helpful just to give a little bit of my background story but because that kind of explains some of um, my thinking and some of the things I'm going to talk about today. I um, was a teacher, I'm a history and social science teacher and I was a teacher before I had children and so I took some time off when my kids were little and I didn't really enjoy teaching the first time around. I was uh, quite young and I think just not particularly confident and so I thought what would I like to do? So I retrained as a librarian and um, not a teacher librarian, as a librarian and so I thought okay I'm going to become a librarian and my first job as a librarian um, I went and worked in a public library for a couple of years and that was a very interesting experience because it was very different to working in a school, uh, of course lots of similarities working with people but lots of uh, different ways in their, the way they structure and manage the environment and I, uh, a job came up at St Andrews teaching in, in, as a teacher librarian I thought you know I, I wouldn't mind going back to school so uh, I've not looked back, I've loved it, I've been at St Andrews for five years and um, so I haven't actually been a librarian for that long, it's only about six and a half years I've been a librarian. So some of the things I'm saying today are coming from the perspective of someone who's come into the profession fairly recently and looked at some of the things that are going on in our profession and just reflected and kind of asked questions about why things have been the way they have been since I've moved in to the profession and what I noticed uh, moving from the public library and a council library into the school library was um, public libraries are very outward looking, they have to work very hard to get their clients through the door and I started to think uh, and notice that in school libraries there's a lot of, uh, quite a lot of defensiveness, um, a bit of victim, you know, we're, we're kind of underappreciated, people don't understand us in the school bit of a contrast and I found public libraries quite positive and outward looking and when I started uh, looking into the profession in school librarianship was a bit surprised by the negativity and the sense of doom and gloom that you know do we have a future um, and it, what's it going to look like for us. So the whole area of the future of school libraries has fascinated me since I started working in a school library and just to see you know have I joined a profession that's about to collapse in a heap um, is this actually, have I joined a profession <laughs> really when it's maybe got 10 years left or does it have a real future? So one of the uh, questions I've asked myself quite often in just listening to people talking about their jobs is has our profession become about just keeping ourselves in a job until it's time to retire or are we seeking to move those long-standing core values of our profession into the future, those values of lifelong learning, like you know, giving access to information, making sure that it's, there's a safe place for people to spend time. Um, are we interested in information literacy skills? Those things that we've always carried as important, but how are we going to move those into the future in light of particular challenges that we're facing at the moment? Um, so this today, I guess, is an opportunity to think big, to think about um, what 
our role is in the schools that we work in to ask the big questions about what we're trying to achieve and to, to ask ourselves what we're doing as a profession and have we got bogged down in detail and that negativity rather than a positive outlook that can take us forward. Um, I think it's important for us in our library services to reflect what are those core values? Do we still hold those as, a, as central to what we're trying to do and how do they fit within the context of the wider school organisation's values? Are they matching or are we moving in different directions? This is just an example on the screen I've got of our library and within our library, our vision and our mission, partly because I think those big ideas can help shape the the day-to-day -day small decisions that we're all moving in the same direction. Um, one of the things that people often I hear librarians say is, but I don't want to get involved in the politics of the school. I really want to just get on with my thing and not get bogged down with all the different things that are going on in the school. And sadly, I think we can't do that. I think we have to actually be in there, in the heart of what's going on. So we do know, what, what, do, what does the executive care about? What are their plans for the future? What does the school council want to see happen with our school and actually to be in there and asking the hard questions and to get the information so that we're not uh, moving in our own direction and actually find ourselves isolated because we haven't got involved in the politics and we haven't thought hard about how we fit in with what else is going on in the environment that we're working in. So today I want to talk about uh, three um, kind of categories I guess of how we think about our library service at St Andrews. Um, we think about our teaching and learning, particularly the roles of how we work with teachers, how we work with students across the school. And the second category is you know, obviously the management of our resources, how we um, provide the right resources to support learning in the school and recreational needs of students and teachers. And also of course the space and what are we doing with the space and thinking about what's the future of our space and how can we uh, make that a positive future in our school. So firstly I want to talk about uh, teaching and learning and thinking about what it look, what that role is going to look like into the future. Um, this is something I've, I often reflect on is that people often you'll find, you, I'm sure you all have this experience where people say, oh you're a librarian so you must be really, you know, you must be reading books all day and you must, it must be so quiet and it gets frustrating because you think, well I'm I, like I'm not doing any of that actually, and but that traditional perception continues. And what I think sometimes is that traditional perception can also mean that the people who come into our profession can be attracted by that traditional perception. And then we end up with problems where we end up with people who want to become librarians who don't particularly have the kind of future focused qualities that we need. So the traditional perception is that, you know, we protected the resource, resources, you know, all that time we spend uh, creating security around the resources. Uh, if anyone needed reliable information, we were the only people that could provide that. And sometimes I think there's still an element of that. You know, it's fine if people want to use it Google, but really, actually, it's the librarians who really know what's going on. And we, we often find ourselves having those kinds of conversations, which can be a bit um, dismissive of the reality of people's experience of finding information. Uh, we protect the space, you know, we're very, what, um, worried about particular things, often there's a lot of rules and um, signs in, in libraries because there's things you can and can't do in libraries. And um, yeah, librarians, quiet, bookish, or, or cranky. So either they're quiet or they're screaming at people. That's the perception. You, you have either the cranky looking librarian or the, the librarian who's hiding in the corner. And often they're passive, so they kind of get dumped. Whatever anyone wants done, they get dumped on them and they'll they'll roll with it. There's not a sense that there's a, a librarian would be proactive and making change. And also people um, quite people think, oh well maybe they didn't actually have to work with people. Maybe they could just hide away. And I think sometimes people maybe get confused with archivists who do maybe spend more time on their own than librarians. And even archivists though have to work with people all the time. So there's funny perceptions that can creep into the way we, we look at our roles. Um, so I would like to suggest that the future librarian actually is quite different to that and I think we all know that. But I think what we need to be saying as a profession is really selling that and when people are interested in joining the profession saying, you know, if you want to join our profession you kind of need to be these things. You need to be 
people orientated. You need to be someone who can cope with lots of change. You need to be someone who's going to take initiative and make things happen and take risks and be prepared to fail. You're going to be someone who's a, a solution creator, a problem solver, someone who says yes a lot, who's not just um, you know, crying that they're too busy or that they can't do anything. Um, and especially when it comes to working with our clients and our users, actually saying yes, we can help you rather than uh, a message of we've got so much on, sorry, we're unavailable for you because we've got all these other very busy things to do. I mean, not of course that any of you out there understand those busy things that we're doing, um, but we're very busy and sometimes that can be a real barrier. Um, we kind of, I think we do have to love technology to a point. I think if we hate technology, then that's going to make the future quite difficult for us because that is the future and we need to be getting our heads around that. Um, and also a person who's embedded, embedded in the organisation, loves working with other people. Um, and I think also this idea that information literacy skills are going to be vitally important. And within that, understanding the curriculum has, and we keep working to understand the curriculum, curriculum changes, and that we're actually across the school experts in what's going on in different parts of learning in the school. Um, and also I think we need to be fun, I think we need to be a positive influence in the school. When often teachers are very stressed out by uh, you know, heavy loads of teaching, we can maybe be people that provide a different dynamic. We're not in a faculty with all the politics of those faculties, we can kind of be there as a bit more of a neutral person. Um, so I think that we need people who can assist our community to navigate the information overload um, and I think that's more important than ever before. Um, more than a lot of other things we do, we need to have that expertise. We need to show people that we can help them, we can help them find what they need, that we can help people uh, work out how do I find the good stuff in all the midst of all the options that are presented to me, and especially for our students to find um, resources that are accessible for them, that they can understand. I found this great quote um, in an article what will, I think the library, the article was called What Will Libraries Be Like in 2100? I've got the, a link to it at the end of the presentation. But I like this quote because it made us sound very exciting as librarians. I'll just read it out. It says, in a world of super abundant information, they, that's libraries, curate, collect and discriminate and care for the good stuff, the stuff really smart people have worked to create and preserve. The stuff you can rely on when you want to understand the world deeply and accurately. The stuff too complicated to come into existence by crowdsourcing. Too unpopular to be foisted on us by corporations or politicians. Libraries, smart, professional, dispassionate about everything except the truth, are the Jedi Knights of our culture's future and deserve to be respected for that. So if you're feeling that perhaps you're not valued, just think of yourself as a Jedi Knight protecting uh, the truth. And I find that quite inspiring. And I do think that we are in a position to find the good stuff, that material that will support student learning. Um, and this is a question, again, it's a bit out there and possibly, you know, might not make me particularly popular. But I do like to think of our role in the school, that if the library space got taken away, and for some of us in some schools that is a genuine threat, um, that the library space, is, what, uh, principals want to use the library space for a different type of environment, maybe moving more to a learning commons model where the library side of it's not as significant. And uh, I do know schools where they're just not replacing the library if um, there's a change in staff. And so I guess I've been asked myself that question is if that space got taken away, and you know we've been doing a lot of culling, getting rid of uh, physical books and the maybe the books aren't there anymore, what should be left standing in our profession? And I think what should be left standing is our expert contribution to the core business of the school. That's the teaching and learning. Like, are we adding with our skills to the student's experience and the teacher's experience of learning in the school? And I'm not saying this just for teach librarians. I do think that uh, every person who works in the school library contributes enormously to the um, the core values of the school if we choose to do so. So if we put ourselves out there and start to listen to students and teachers, start to understand what they're doing in the classroom, start to talk to them about what they're reading and their literacy needs and what kind of information they need. 
I think all of our staff members can do this. This is not just for teachers. And get in there and start understanding uh, what a difference our particular set of skills can make to uh, how people are learning. So um, what can you do to make sure that this is the case, that your skill set is really valued? Um, these are just simple ideas and I'm sure lots of you are doing this and these are just some things from my own experience. Um, I think it's important that librarians are involved in the wider school life. Um, it's about networking. Remember those people are about the people we want in the profession and networkers and they're connected and that they know they're collaborating with people and the only way you can actually really start to become connected and, and get opportunities to collaborate is by knowing people. It's very much a relational job. And so you need to be someone who is uh, creating opportunities to be known. So things like getting involved with extracurricular activities, being on different committees, leading PD when the opportunity arises, just grabbing every opportunity to stay connected in the school. Because it is about our skill set and letting people know uh, what we can offer. I think um, as teacher librarians particularly, I think it's important that we're involved in the classroom, that we're willing to go into classrooms, that we're willing to teach, that we're willing to say, sure, you know, you, you need someone to cover that, I, I'll cover that class. And I know in lots of schools you may be doing lots of RFF and so you're um, doing that all day. Uh, I'm mostly working in a secondary context where all our teaching opportunities are in uh, conjunction with classroom teachers and we have to make that happen. But we have to also convey a confidence in our teaching skills that people will believe that we can do that. And I think my other concern has been in the profession is watching the profession and looking at who uh, often ends up as a teacher librarian. And sometimes it's people who didn't particularly want to be a teacher and who didn't really like being in the classroom or found the classroom very difficult. And to be honest, if someone came to me like that who wanted a job working in my department, I don't think I would even interview them because even if they were brilliantly uh, you know, qualified or experienced, what I want to see is someone, people who love kids, who want to, who are desperate to get into the classroom, who really want to spend time with students and talking to them and teaching them and educating them. If we have people joining the profession who are fleeing the classroom, then they need to not work in a school, um, to be perfectly blunt. I don't, I'm being a little bit controversial at this point, but it's not helping the profession. If we have people who are negative about students, who are negative about working with teachers, I have found personally I think this is contributing to this negative narrative that can run around in school libraries. I think if we're um, also known in school that of particular skills that we have, staff and students and parents will come and talk to us and that we're known as an expert. I also think we need to collect data and collect information on what we're doing in the classroom, how we're making a difference to student learning. And this is going to only become more important into the future. Again, coming from a public library where every visit to the library was counted, um, I found it's a different kind of environment in schools. Often it's a community, much a smaller community. But we do need to justify our existence. And if we think we're doing a great job, we need to generate the evidence to show that we are doing a great job. And we are doing a great job. I think there's lots of cases we're doing a wonderful job, but um, can be very busy and, and collecting data feels like a bit of an afterthought. Just on a side note, um, I just wanted to make say something about maker spaces. Um, they're all the rage. So every time I read anything to do with the future of libraries, it involves something to do with maker spaces. And I, I'm raising this because I want to go back to this issue of what is our core business. Our core business is teaching and learning. And I have no problem with makerspaces. I think they're fantastic. I think they are great for student learning. I think they do enhance um, outcomes for students uh, and giving them that opportunity. But what I'm seeing in some contexts is that the library has become the makerspace or the library has become defined by the makerspace. And I think we have to be very careful when the makerspace is what's keeping us alive in an organisation. Because there's absolutely nothing stopping someone else in the school, another teacher, developing those skills and being as capable as a, a teacher librarian to make the makerspace move ahead. So as much as I think makerspaces are great, I think they're a great use of the space. We do our own little things at St Andrews um, and, you know, we kind of, students are in building a computer at the moment. There's all sorts of little things going on and I think to a, a, 
an extent libraries probably have always had lunchtime activities and craft activities going. We've just got a nice fancy name for them now. But I think it's important to keep asking yourself, is the makerspace keeping me here in a job? Is it actually just keeping me alive? Because if it is, then you need to start looking at what you're doing and thinking about whether that is actually going to sustain and future-proof your service within the organisation. So I'm sorry if I've upset everybody on the makerspace issue, but I do feel quite strongly that we need to start to be a bit more reflective sometimes about the place of that in our, our schools. You can ignore me if you want at any point <laughs> and take what you will from this. Um, the second thing I just wanted to talk about quickly is our resources. This is a photo of last year. We did a cull of our nonfiction. Um, I became the head of library at the beginning of last year, so that a lot of the changes have happened in the last little while as we've just sort of spent time reflecting on what we're doing. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of non-fiction books in our staff room, kind of trapping our library um, staff <laughs> in the corner of the staff room. It was a huge process. We culled 50% and I think we're still going. It's quite a long process of reviewing and trying to work out what we do and don't need to keep. I mean, basically I'm at the point, if a student can easily find the answer to a question, on their iPads, and our school is one-to-one -one iPads, which again has shifted um, how our collection is being used, um, then we don't need to keep those books. They take up space. Space, we're in an office block in the city. Space is a premium for us. So a lot of the decisions we make are to clear space. We need space for student learning, and um, there's always you know, need and demand for collaborative spaces. So the, the, how we make decisions about what we've kept is often determined by um, how valuable we feel that, that is in, in exchange for the space that it will create. This is a question I've asked my team a lot. Is, that, is our collection set up for us, the librarians, or is it set up for the users? And I'm talking from the big questions of, you know, what books we keep in the collection um, to things as simple as do we need all those labels and all those stamps and all those different instructions on the books? Because are those actually about us having a system for shelving or finding books and trying to find a balance where the processes that we do aren't so skewed to the way librarians work that there's actually, uh, it makes sense to users as well. And just trying to, we kind of, I guess I got everything, just threw it up in the air and questioned everything. Uh, we stopped putting magnetic strips into our books because the um, security gates didn't work all the time anyway and students just walked out. Um, with books. So we were spending quite a lot of time and money putting magnetic strips into books that it wasn't effective particularly. So thinking again of is are the things we're doing keeping us in a job and keeping us busy or are we actually concerned about what's working for the users and what they actually want and what they need. Um, sometimes books are, I think are kept in collections because it makes us feel as librarians that we have good things to offer. Whether those books have been touched in 20 years doesn't often seem to be uh, relevant, but we do need to ask those user-centric questions all the time. Does it make sense? Will this make sense where these books are located? We moved to genre um, locations for our fiction collection last year because there's those kids. there are those kids who just want to read crime and there are those kids who just want to read dystopian and it just makes it easier for them. Um, Again, moving to having lots of books front facing so that students can find things easily. And maybe that's not as easy for the librarians to shelve and to find things. But we're the ones with the skill, we set it up so we can actually choose um, how we use that collection. But it needs to make sense uh, to the people who are coming into our library. Um, it's been interesting thinking about the resource, the future resource provision. Obviously, there's obvi there's things like ebooks, which we've got a bit of hit and miss. We're not that wrapped in it. We haven't had a huge uptake. Fiction is still very popular. Physical fiction is still popular. I do think that issue of resources defining our role is a bit uh, can be a bit risky. Again, because um, we know that students find information so often just themselves online, they don't need us. And so perhaps resource provision won't be so reliant on the presence of a physical librarian. Um, finding the information I think is going to become more important and helping them find the information online rather than finding the books, the physical books. And perhaps there's, I've read some things saying that also the individual libraries perhaps don't need to keep every access to every individual database or every book because we've got going to have increased number of things digitized which makes things more accessible and there'll be more um, access uh, as time goes on. 
rather than less. And I do think for us, we need to think carefully about how our users are experiencing our services online. I've thought a lot about what we do in our digital provision of resources, as, and I want it to match and actually probably exceed what we're offering in our physical space. This is where our students are learning. They're learning online. The top shot on that screen is of our school management system, learning management system called Schoology. We were very excited in first term to finally get a course into there so students can access all our resources through the, the platform where they're learning. Um, the middle screen is of our new school library website, uh, which you can Google if you want to have a look at it. And the bottom screen is our Infinity, uh, just a, the search bar in our Infinity catalog. And again, the reason um, we went with Infinity is I love this idea that we're, um, we're going to one place to find, to provide access to resources. That's the student's experience. They go onto Google to find whatever they want. And we need to start thinking how we, what access points are we providing for students? Are we making it simple? Is it really, really complicated? Do they have to go to five different places? So these three, I guess, these three areas of our system in the library, we're trying to streamline access. It's not easy, it's not straightforward, it's actually quite a frustrating process. But Infinity, I think, is the beginning of a step in the right direction for school libraries in having a discovery platform. And hopefully over time that, will, that concept will become more streamlined. And uh, the cloud-based service, so you can use your service anywhere, you can use it in the classroom, kids can access things at home 24-7. I think it's hugely important in how we're moving forward. Um, I'm going to just show you, talk to you a little bit about some of uh, the changes we've made in our space. In, um, and I guess everyone's probably thinking changes to space. And the reason I'm talking about this last is because often when we think about the future of libraries, there's that kind of visual image of changing space and putting different furniture in and things like that. Um, I hesitate to say this, but I, uh, my gut feeling is that space is um, the, the possibly the third <laughs> in my list of priorities. And you might be surprised by that because it's space is kind of represents us. The library space is what uh, people think about when they think about a library. Um, but just going back to my thing about talking about our online presence, I really want actually our online presence to kind of become more important. Than, than the space because I do think that um, we're going to reach more students if we can get this whole digital uh, resource provision thing sorted. Um, I think it's complicated. I think the last webinar that uh, Infinity ran uh, where Chelsea spoke was enormously helpful and if you haven't listened to that because I think Chelsea asked good questions about how we put together our digital uh, collection. And it's really worth listening to that. So I'm not going to go over all of that again. But I, I do feel that if we're not addressing this issue, then we're just actually missing this huge opportunity to capture students who perhaps aren't coming into the space, who aren't, um, who are at home at 11 o'clock on a you know Tuesday night freaking out because they have something due the next day. And we need to be there. We need to be in that. Um, the hard thing about digital provision is it takes a lot of promotion, it takes a lot of time from us to actually get into the classrooms, talk to students about it, educate staff about what's available and we're just at the beginning of that. I think we're um, only just starting to get ahead around how do we actually get take up on this. I have to say that having had a new website where students can just Google Sachs Library and get straight into it um, has been fantastic and we've seen a big increase in our users and also uh, the catalogue directly, we link from the website so students can log in through that into Infinity and um, get access to that. Again, the whole cloud-based thing I think has really shifted the opportunities that we have in the profession to be at the point of need for students and not, again, relying on them coming into our space. But anyway, back to the space, just talking about some of the changes we've made in the last 18 months. Um, the top photo is our uh, shelving, you know, which is traditional library shelving, our non-fiction collection particularly is there. Um, and the bottom shelf is just, we shortened those shelves by two, sh two shelves, I think, 
or actually even just took the top shelf, one shelf off. Um, it's a subtle difference, but what we've done is it means we have line of sight across the library. So when I was teaching yesterday afternoon, I could see some students mucking up at the other end and they were a bit shocked because I could actually see them. But it just changes the whole feel of the library, not just from a classroom management point of view, but actually from um, the way it feels as a community space. Um, some students are disappointed that they can't run up and down the long, um, the high shelves anymore and hide. Um, but aside from that, it's all been very positive. Lots of comments about the amount of light that comes into the space. And again, for us, light is a huge challenge because we're in an office block and um, we want there's parts of our library that get no external light. So you want to maximise the opportunity to get light in and again to make it a really um, attractive space for people to come in. This is not the end process. We're still wrestling with non-fiction and where to locate it and what to do with it and it, it's not a particularly well, it's hardly touched. So if anyone's got brilliant ideas about non-fiction, I'm very interested to hear it because um, I know that Knox Grammar has gone to having their non-fiction arranged by subjects, which I find very interesting. Um, again, because Dewey doesn't particularly make sense with it to anyone except us. Again, it's a very library-centric sort of process now. Um, we don't always teach kids that much about it. Um, and so, yeah, like how books are arranged that in a way that makes sense to users. When students and teachers go into bookstores, they don't go looking for a Dewey number, they go looking for a category. So I think that's probably the future, but how you do that and how you arrange that is quite um, a process to think through. Um, I guess, again, we haven't made any huge changes to the layout of our space. Um, we've most, everything we've done is fairly cosmetic and just you know, in this example, you'll see the one on the left is from about two years ago. Uh, we got new computers, that was quite nice. Um, and we got some new furniture last year just to modern, modernise the space a little bit. Um, we've opened the blinds and that was, for some reason, the blinds were often closed. I'm not sure if that was to protect the computers. But again, by shortening the shelves, even simple things like we've, we've painted the whole library white, just very white, because then things like the books and furniture sort of stand out and brighten up the space. I'm crossing my fingers for new carpet at any time, but <laughs> that's a big process and um, seems to be kind of coming at some point. Uh, again, more more shots of just trying to brighten it up, open windows, open space. Um, it, we're in the top right-hand corner where those boys are sitting on bean bags. Actually, that, that, there were two bays of non-fiction shelving there before, um, which we've kind of, that's gradually disappeared in the last two or three years. But they're the spaces that are highly sought after. Teachers like having them in the spaces. The kids just love the relaxed seating. And one of my things when we go back to thinking what are our core values as a library service is that concept of a safe space, that neutral sort of space. And I, I think for me that really shapes how I look at the space is that even though there's always threats to the space. I like to say to the school, look, there's not many places in a school environment where students can just um, be relaxed. They're mixing with the kids from other age groups. They're not having to um, you know, sit in formal rows and do study and listen to a teacher. They actually have time to, in soft seating and things like that, to just have options and relax and socialise. and. Um, even quiet spots just to sit and, and do their own thing. And I like it that we can provide that for, for our students. Um, this is another space we renovated last year. Um, we had a collection for, of all our HSC uh, study guides that we moved from quite formal um, shelving and replaced it with a magazine stand and just opened that space up for students to be able to um, hang out in. Part of the reason we were able to do this is because at the beginning of last year we actually opened up a separate uh, library for our senior students, so for our year 10 to 12 students in another part of the building. And that's a much more formal study space, it's beautiful um, and brand, brand new. But it meant that we could actually free up uh, our main library, which is a K-12, well it is a K-12 library, but it kind of freed up some of the more quiet formal space for more um, other uses which aren't as um, kind of traditional I guess. 
this is another change we made um, and you might think that the left looks very nice and does look very nice and tidy and formal and beautiful and it is. Um, what happened was uh, when, before I came on as head of department, our department was restructured and uh, we had a number of people retire, um, a few people who uh, were not replaced on contracts and things like that and so our staff team actually uh, reduced. We also then added another library so we lost library staff to working with that um, secondary, uh, senior library. So we had a, our circulation desk here, this is the entrance to our library. You can kind of see on the left there's a ramp and the main bit of our library. This beautiful desk was custom built and but what happened was staff uh, were on a roster to be on the circulation desk and, and then that worked fine when we had more people, but we had to change things. Again, we threw everything up in the air, kind of caught what came down, and we changed it so that our circulation desk is right in the middle of the library. It's smack bang in the middle of everything else. Um, if anyone saw Steph Gaspari's uh, webinar last time, she talks about this idea of hot desks and that, that uh, her staff are in the library, working in the library. And we were kind of forced into that because we had less staff, but um, my librarian and library technician just love it. They love that they're working in the space. Um, they're not sitting in a separate isolated part of the entranceway to the school, uh, to, the, to the library. And so they can actually be there. They can um, have those conversations with students. They can watch the student who's wandering around looking um, kind of lost and aimless. They can supervise students. They can have, they just found themselves having a lot more conversations. And students, we think, borrow more because they're not having to come all the way to a very formal and imposing uh, circulation desk. Down the track, that returns, where that returns desk on, on the right-hand side, we really want to move. Um, that's a quite a, actually quite a large circulation space. We'd like to move um, out of that into uh, some smaller hot desk type situation. But again, we're still in a state of flux. And we have found just trying different things is quite helpful in terms of that process of change and reflecting on what has and hasn't worked for us. Um, and so it will keep changing as we try different things. Uh, this is another little space that we've actually just in the last week have um, renovated. On the left hand side, is it actually looks fantastic. It's our junior, um, our primary school area and it looks fantastic. It had this tiered seating which is very cool and actually got lots of comments. The problem was it was quite steep and so students would often well, semi-regularly kind of fall off it. And then often our older students also liked jumping. Everyone loves it because it's something we can jump off it from a height. And so we also found that um, it was great, but it took up a lot of floor space. And because our goal now is really to be as flexible with our spaces, to make our spaces work for us in for multi-purpose uses, um, having something like that with just very fixed was quite limiting. And our um, my junior school librarian, teacher librarian, really wanted a space where she can put some furniture, maybe have a screen there and do some sort of in information literacy in an area that's allocated for the junior students. So that's a work in progress. But um, just again, it just represents that idea that what we're trying to do with our space is to free it up, uh, to be used for different purposes, to put furniture that can be moved, packed up easily for different things. Um, this is another big change that you probably lots of you have had this where you've we had a, this was our computer room on the left hand side which before we went one to one iPads was vitally important highly heavily used um, booked out all the time for classes and because students had no other way of um, getting onto technology in 2014 we, we went to one to one iPads from 7 to 12 and now we actually have them uh, from year five up, which meant they just changed the dynamic of what the service we were offering. It meant that um, students didn't need to come to us as often and I think that's really um, affected what service we can offer and that actually librarians can go into classrooms, we can teach information skills in classrooms with the students having the technology there, don't have to disrupt them to take them out of the normal routine and I think um, Initially, we were wondering, oh, you know, what are we going to do? They're not, they don't need to come to us for technology anymore. We've got to redefine our role yet again. And I, I actually think it's provided more opportunities to be very relevant in um, getting in and talking to students about what they can do with their iPads. 
So the, on the right-hand side is a photo I just took yesterday. This is one of our uh, Year 6 classes who was doing, who were working on a green screen project. We changed our technology room, took all the computers out and painted all the walls green last year. But it's also a multi-purpose space. It's a space where we have students coming in for reading lessons and they can use it for wide reading um, when teachers bring their classes down. Uh, again, aiming for flexibility, aiming for multi-purpose and aiming to be receptive to what you know, student and teacher demands are. This is the green room has been a fantastically popular uh, change, and has given us uh, a, a kind of a new lease of relevance in the school, um, and has been well used as well. Uh, the left hand side is just another example of our green room. The the multi-purpose our library because we put all our shelves on wheels and all our tables on wheels. It's been used a few times for functions, which has been a new sort of again a new reason for our being, I guess. And this is an example of the library being cleared out for an event. Uh, I think it was the drinks after the speech night event. We're actually on the ground floor, so we're a very attractive space uh, for people in terms of access. So it was exciting to be able to work with our marketing team to think, well, how can we use our space, make it available? And it was fantastic on the night. It was, the room was full of dignitaries and you know, all the important people in the organisation who came into the space. And even if they weren't consciously looking at what we had on offer, just the idea that they were in there, that we were, you know, we were still alive, <laughs> we're still uh, part of the community. It was a great opportunity for us. Um, and we need to be careful with those sorts of things that we're not too scared of the hassle factor in that. When I became a librarian, no one told me that I'd be setting up, packing up furniture as much as I do. That's not in the degree, they don't tell you that. Um, but certainly when I was working in a public library, we were constantly packing up, setting up for events. And, um, and I think that's just part of the joy of having a space that we can share. In saying all this, I kind of interhated before, but perhaps um, we need to make the space fantastic but again it's our it's our knowledge and what skills we have as information professionals that are going to see us into the future if as you know the computers have become less relevant what, what have we replaced that is with what, our skills what we can offer and if the space gets taken away or the space you know people don't see a value for it we still are really important in the organisation and we need to make sure people understand that we're important beyond the space, that we're important beyond um, keeping the area tidy and managing students at lunch time. Because often it can become that our role is so heavily tied into the space that people miss all these other fantastic things that we have on offer because the space is big and it can dominate everyone's horizon. So we need to keep asking ourselves, in terms of future proofing, not just our role, but what we offer and the values that we want to promote, um, are we making sure that the organisation understands that in the face of all these other things that are traditionally perceived about our role? So I'm just going to finish up there. Um, at the end, this last slide, I've just um, got a link there to a pearl trees collection that I've, over the last few years, just been adding little articles I find about the future of libraries, I find it very interesting. And so if you can have a look there, see if there's there any articles there you want to kind of snaffle for yourself. Um, and if you want to follow our journey, um, we're on Instagram and Facebook. You can check out our website um, just to see. We're certainly, when I say all these things, just take whatever you want with a grain of salt. It's a very uh, uncertain future. I could be just talking through my hat and it may all be completely different to uh, the the vision of what I think might happen. Um, but I do hope that people have found something I've said today a little bit thought-provoking and helpful and um, happy to have questions um, if people have any. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was um, that was actually very interesting and we got, um, we got a lot of positive feedback. I don't know if you can see the question section though, can you? Uh, there's something flashing, should I tap that? <laughs> <laughs> if you want, oh, you might yeah. be able to. Yes, I can see something, yes. Um, I've kind of sorted through the questions um, and the comments. Um, we can have a read through them just afterwards. Um, but Karen Bonanno at the beginning asked a question. Uh, you, you might be able to see that one actually. Uh, what key attributes of public library service approach? Uh, sorry, 
what are the key attributes of a public library service approach that school libraries could benefit from, in your opinion? Yes, great question, Karen. And actually, I, I often think about this because the thing that struck me most were coming to school libraries was that um, people didn't seem to be particularly interested in promotion or not particularly, not particularly interested, but it just wasn't a strong agenda. Whereas when I worked in a public library, um, for every event that I organised, a huge percentage of my time was spent on promoting it, getting people through the door. Because in, when you work in a public system, you have to justify every event that you put on with statistics. Like you have to show that the money that's being spent on that event can be justified. And so one of the things, I haven't spoken about that today, it's another pet thing of mine is promotions. I think that we need to promote ourselves and partly through data, but just through letting people know, what are you doing? Are you doing some great stuff? Um, making sure that people are constantly aware of what we're doing. And um, yeah, so I think the fact that public libraries have to work hard to get people through the door and to justify their existence. Whereas in schools, you've kind of got a captive audience. So it can be, you can become a bit complacent thinking, well, you know, there's kind of kids around. Um, what, mind you, what percentage of our student body is actually, are we engaged in? What percentage of our teaching, teaching staff are actually engaged with our library services? Um, so one of my goals for my staff this year is to say, I would like by the end of this year that all, all of our faculties have had some kind of contact with our library service in some way. So we're kind of keeping track and a sense of accountability that we're actually not just working with history or just working with English, but that, you know, science has had a look in because all of our departments need us. Uh, we have to believe that, uh, but we have to make that happen by getting ourselves out there. Thanks, Karen. That's great. We had another question from Karen that came a little bit later on, um, asking you if you involve students in the design and creation process of, um, well, of your library, really. Yeah, that's a great question. I've, I think we haven't, um, to, other than observing their behaviour um, and watching how they use the space. Um, certainly watching students come in and enjoying the space has informed a lot of our decision making. Um, but I have been thinking, and I was very provoked into thinking of this by watching uh, Steph's presentation. She's done a really great job of involving her users in the process. And I certainly think as we move forward, that's something we need to work on. So yeah, great question. Uh, we've got a question from Jennifer Kane uh, asking, uh, in what ways do you work with teachers in planning and designing the curriculum? Um, yeah, so it, that's one of the hardest things to get traction on, and I, I'm sure other people will agree with me, me on that one. Um, we, I just kind of grab any opportunity that comes up. Some teachers, you have a long history with working with them, and it just happens. They'll always come to you and say, look, we're working on this project. Can you come in and just look at um, how we can support you? You can support us in developing a good research strategy. Um, our school has recently introduced the IB Middle Years program, so I was involved and that the IB is very strong on teacher librarian involvement, which is kind of fantastic because it just makes it happen. So last year I was involved in all the Year 7 planning for, um, we started Year 7 this year, so all of last year I was involved in all the planning for that. Um, the biggest way I find is just by being around and having conversations with people and saying, you know, do you need help with that? I've been asked also to review a lot of um, assessment tasks to see that their uh, process in the research process actually is uh, helpful and solid. I know that my senior librarian who works with our 10 to 12 students does a lot of um, reviewing of assessment tasks and just looking at the kinds of questions that teachers are asking and whether they are reasonable because often they ask very complex questions that students actually don't have the skills to answer. Um, so a lot of it is relational bits and pieces, but um, making sure that we're offering, letting people know what we're doing, letting people know what we've done with other um, teachers. So there's a word of mouth element to it. So it's not particularly a clear structure. Um, it's probably a little bit more haphazard. Okay, so you might be able to see all these comments and questions coming in at the moment. Our positive feedback from Lou. Um, thank you very much, Jenny, again. <laughs> um, let's see, we're sharing any of the experiences. Uh, whoops. 
which extracurricular activities are you involved in and which committees have you joined from Veronica? Um, okay, so I have to do a sport <laughs> because we're in an independent school. So I'm a, I'm a manager of a netball team, um, which, you know, at one level is a pain. Everyone complains about it. At the other level, I get to spend quite a lot of time uh, with students and traveling to games with other teachers and I've quite enjoyed that. Um, I'm not particularly sporty myself, but I'm happy to be involved in that. That photo I had on the screen of when I was talking about extracurricular was me walking behind my year seven. Uh, I have a tutorial group, a pastoral group, so we went on camp and I walked with them whinging for a day. Um, I have city city kids who don't get out that much. Um, but they, yeah, that sort of thing, that was um, fun to just be out there spending time with them. And committees I've been involved in, I've, on the technology committee, I guess, because we have something to do with technology, um, I'm often asked, asked to be involved in pastoral committees, reviewing pastoral, because we do have a lot of students who come and use our space, often our students who have particular issues um, are in our space. As you know, you tend to get the students who may be a bit um, the fringe, um, and so I'm often involved in pastoral committees of, in various levels of the school. Um, so they're probably the two main areas. I'm thinking there might be something else, Mait often maintenance discussions, but yeah. So, I mean, one of the things you find when you're a librarian is that you know everyone. You, you kind of should be in good relationships with the executive, curriculum development, pastoral issues, but also down to, you know, understanding, like knowing who all the cleaners are, they're going to be your good friends, and also all the guys in the maintenance who can help you the maintenance, all the guys, people on technology, uh, the IT team. It's one of those amazing roles, actually, where you get to be involved with people from across the school. So there's lots of opportunities, I think, to actually strengthen connections. Great. Um, do, 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 do we have any other questions from attendees? It's been nearly one hour, so just, yep. Uh, what are your opening hours? What are your hours? Sorry. Okay, so we're open from 8 to 5. Eight in the morning to five in the afternoon. Yeah, and we open the whole time. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just wanting to let to let everyone know as well. Um, if they had problems with the recording, they can send me an email. Um, it's Theo at concordinfinity.com, and I'll um, send you the recording. Um, it'll take about a week, maybe a bit less than a week, for me to have it fully uploaded and and cropped up properly. Uh, do we have any other questions before? We can go. Or any other further comments you would like to add, Jenny? Um, just saying, I'm very happy if people want to contact me um, offline or via Twitter. And um, if people want to visit and have a look and come and have a chat, always happy for visitors and just to share uh, what's going on for us. And certainly, um, by no means an expert, but just happy to talk with other people, but lots of other people are a lot more experienced than I do. So very happy to always get input and ideas from other people. So yeah, but thanks for the opportunity to share with you guys today. And I, it has, I have appreciated um, the feedback from people. So. Okay, well if we, oh hang on, what's this? This is a webinar has been fabulous. Thank you very much, Tracy. Oh, and thank you, it's so nice, real people. <laughs> I guess it was a bit awkward um, being a presentation without actual um, feedback on the spot, but you know, people were listening, so it was great. I enjoyed Thanks, it too. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, um, I guess this is going to conclude the webinar, unless we've got another question or so coming in. And um, thank you very much, um, Jenny. It was, um, it was a pleasant, pleasant presentation. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, this will be sent to those who've registered or to those who email me. Um, also, I got, uh, Jenny, I, someone has requested your references. Um, if you want to share this, um, you can email it to me and then anyone, or yeah, email it to me and anyone who emails me about that, I can forward it on, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, well thank you very much everyone and especially thank you very much Jenny. Uh, yeah. Yep, there fantastic. Thanks Leo. Yeah, really appreciate the time. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.